have a really bad connection. Yes, I put, uh, I start the recording. I start. Oh, okay, great. If I will be able to record online, then it's great. If not, uh, we'll use yours, okay? Okay, okay, good. I don't know how does it interfere with the Imperial network, but it looks like yes. Mm Mm -hmm. Maybe we can wait one minute because That's people fine. are just coming. Right. Let me open the title. Okay, maybe we can start. Hello, everybody. Today we have a great pleasure to listen to the talk by John Donagu. He will tell us about simple models for quadratic gravity. Please, John, one hour. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just get the full screen up. Does everyone mm -hmm. see that? Oh, great. Okay, so <clears throat> what I, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to have this nice series going. Uh, my goal here today is to look at the issues of quadratic gravity, but using simpler models to understand some of them. But gravity, of course, always has extra complications um, due to the gauge invariance, the multiple degrees of freedom. Um, and these are simpler models that have the same bad degrees of freedom. So in particular, after some motivation, I'll do a higher derivative Yukawa model, a linear sigma model, and a nonlinear sigma model. And the goals here are to pick out some of the, the effects that are also present in quadratic gravity. And in the end, the goal is to, to have a non-perturbative lattice simulation of these, which I've not been done, but we're working towards obtaining. Um, there are some lattice results for such theories. So here's quadratic gravity. It, in addition to the usual Einstein term, there's terms quadratic in the curvatures. Um, it's, it's beautiful feature if you want is it's a renormalizable quantum field theory. The one of the couplings there is asymptotically free, the probably the most important one, the one that governs spin two couplings. Um, and so it's a somewhat attractive model. But it has issues. The issues have to do with the fact that the curvatures are second derivatives of the metric. And so curvature squares are fourth derivatives and higher derivative theories have issues. Um, and so my interest is, is this a viable theory or not? And you know, if it's not, I'm happy to move on. I'm not wedded to this particular theory, but it's, such a conservative theory using the metric as the degree of freedom that it's, I think, worth understanding. 
Um, you've had some talks, or we've had some talks in this series. Um, Alberto Savio just gave a review just, just quite recently about quadratic gravity. Bob Holden's talked about some of the phenomenology. Damiano Anselmi has talked about features of his uh, Fakian issue, uh, descriptions, which is relevant for quadratic gravity. And I'm going to take a look at what I think is the least pleasant aspects of the theory um, and try to look at them in greater detail. Philip Mannheim uh, looked at something that's conformal gravity, which is a slightly different beast, but somewhat related. Um, so what's, what's the problem here? So the problem is that with higher derivatives, you get propagators that go like one over the momentum to the fourth power. And if you partial fraction that, you get the usual massless propagators and you get high mass poles with the wrong sign in front of them. So this, the second term there is the problem. And these break quantum field theory in the sort of recent jargon. Um, if you take very general principles, you get the shalane lehman representation where propagators can be represented in terms of spectral functions that are positive, and so can positive definite, can never fall faster than one over q squared. This falls like one over q to the fourth. So it must break some of the general principles that leads to shalane lehman There's a potential caveat in that this doesn't the spectral representation doesn't apply to gauge currents, but I've never seen any argument that this is relevant for the spin two case, which is the problematic case in quadratic gravity. Um, so here's, here's a brief set of things that we're gonna tour through. This is quadratic gravity. The spin two propagators along with the unstable ghost, it has a funny property. I'll argue that it ages backwards in time leads to causality violation. The theory seems stable and this to many people is a surprise. Surprisingly also unitarity seems to work. And somewhat new here is I'm gonna argue that the running couplings need to be redone, that, that the calculations in the quadratic gravity and, and other related theories um, actually are, are not correct. So, Let's let's just start off with the simplest model. This is the one that's going to take up much of the talk. Um, and the idea here is to have a everything be scalar fields, where the field that here is called phi is the one that's most like the photon or the graviton. It's a scalar, so I've allowed it's a mass, but I'm going to in the end, neglect the mass and formulas and pretend that it's renormalized mass goes to zero. It's coupled up to another particle with a Yukawa coupling. Chi is the other one. You think of that like the electron. So here's an electron, scalar electron coupled up to a scalar photon, um, being the scalar an analog of general relativity. The classical physics here would be a, the classical wave equation in the long wavelength limit below the mass, below the Compton wavelength of the electron. Okay. But we can take this theory, which is easy to understand and make it now dangerous by adding higher order derivatives. So this is the higher derivative version of this. It's um, I have so four derivatives and a, a heavy mass scale. I'd like you to think of this like the Planck mass. It's beyond our where we experiment, but we want to see if it satisfies usual properties at our energies and what goes wrong eventually. Is it stable at our energies? Um, is there a classical limit? Is it stable at high energies, et cetera? Okay, so that's what I'll use this for. So first, the low energy. The, we've got this 
extra term here, we're doing the path integral over phi. I'm going to now just do a few little simple manipulations to put it into a different form where we can see through it a bit. First, I'll use an auxiliary field where, where I add a coupling eta box phi, and then a, a, the heavy mass that's here. And integrating that out, you get exactly the original theory. Okay, the coupling here is still phi chi bar chi. So that's that's, but anyhow, there's no change at this level. The next thing is just to redefine the field variables. I'm taking theirs to the same Lagrangian. I take phi and call it A, which is going to be the photon, and eta, which is going to be the heavy ghost. And again, without any approximation, you get a massless field. I'm neglecting the mass. There could be a mass here. Um, connect coupled up to the electrons or massive particles. And I have the, the ghost field with a heavy mass coupled up to the velocity. So there's couplings in both of those terms. And you've com we've completely decoupled except for that interaction piece, which ties them together. Okay. Um, however, the, the remnant of the problem is that there's a minus sign in front of this part, second Lagrangian. So we've we've decoupled the fields. We now look at that path integral that we started out with before. We get the product of two path integrals. One is e to the i times the action for a normal particle. And the other is e to the minus i times the action for a normal particle. This second one is just the complex conjugate of a normal path integral. And it, it's a Gaussian integral, so it can be done. And we could easily just take the usual answer and complex conjugate it, but let's just step through it a bit. Um, I'm, when I'm doing this, it's a Gaussian integral. To do the Gaussian integral, I add a real part to improve convergence. I shift the variables and get the, a propagator out, which I'll call D minus F, minus being the fact that I've started with E to the minus IS. And now I end up with two minus signs changed. It's a complex conjugate of a usual Feynman propagator. The numerator has a minus sign, the denominator has a minus sign in the I epsilon. You do the, the integration there, and you get a, a chi dagger chi, chi dagger chi, which at low energies, we just, this becomes a contact interaction, chi, chi to the fourth. And if we go back to the original Lagrangian, there was a lambda chi to the fourth interaction there. It just shifts a little bit. So low energies, We've just gotten a, the original normal theory with a U, with a two derivative interaction shifted by with a slightly different value of lambda. It's true that this came with a negative sign, but if lambda was non-zero to begin with, this is this will still be positive for big enough m's. There's no sign of any instability here, so this has a normal the same old classical limit as the normal theory. Um, and and so we we haven't found an instability at, at low energies. So when I take classical limit, I'm really not taking h bar to zero. I'm taking kinematics such that h bar is not important. Where this is then low energy compared to the ghost mass and compared to the electron Compton wave. So this goes against the work of Ostrogradsky. Of course, it's not completely against it because we started off with a quantum theory and we took a limit. Um, Ostrogradsky was starting off with a classical theory um, with higher derivatives and finds that there's a Hamilton Hamiltonian, which is not positive definite in principle, even at low energies. And 
This is the instability that's sometimes used to rule out higher derivative theories. So this is what Oscar Gradsky would do. We've already seen that there's extra degrees of freedom associated with this because there's extra derivatives. He chooses his two canonical variables to be phi and phi dot. The canonical momentum or conjugate to that. The Hamiltonians formed in the usual way. So he's basically doing usual stuff. Um, you have to eliminate phi double dot, which is, is neither of these. So you eliminate it in terms of the momentum and coordinates and you get the Hamilton, the Ostrogotsky Hamilton, I'm sorry, um, Hamiltonian that has this form. Well, you can't really see through it too much, except that the first term is the in interesting piece. The first term has pi one and phi two. Pi one and phi two, if you're treating these as independent variables, can have either sign. And pi two doesn't appear anywhere else in the Lagrangian. So this, this guy produces an instability. It's the only place where pi one appears. Um, these choices seem a bit odd to us. They're done to reproduce Hamilton's equations. Um, and, and you get the Euler-Lagrange equation and Hamilton's equations. Though it's true, if you took the change of variables that we did there, that I did for you, and use those instead, you'd also reproduce Hamilton's equations just because the usual equations and the Euler-Lagrange equations. So there's a second construction here that seems to work. Anyhow, it's not the classical limit of the quantum field theory. And the conclusions from most of Gretzky appear not to hold for this particular case. What was funny in this was I took this thing that seemed like it had a negative Lagrangian, putting it in the path integral, and I had a e to the i s, and all it did was change e to the i s to e to the minus i s. So there's something a bit odd in that step. We've we're I I did it as if it was just a trivial step, but there's something to it. There's something using either the plus is and either the minus is that's different. Classical physics doesn't see this at all. The, there's no factors of i in the laws of classical physics. But quantum physics does have explicit factors of i. In path integral, it's chosen with e to the i s. Commutations rule is i h bar for the commutators. And we see this in propagators with the i epsilon. So what's what's that physics? Here's here's what we did the last time. We were just just now. We used e to the i s instead of e to the minus i s. Um, we completed the square and we got propagators that differed by being complex conjugates of each other. It's not a surprise. If you look at what happens for this this one this e to the minus, it basically takes all the poles and shifts them from where they were in the usual propagators to below the axis or above the axis. And positive energy propagates backwards in time. So what we're seeing is that the factors of i in the, um, in the quantization rules lead to the factors of i epsilon and propagators, which lead to the arrows, the directions of causal pro propagation where it defines the past light cone and the future light cone. And those i epsilons then give you the arrow of causality. And this shouldn't be too much of a surprise for what's going on. The Time reversal is anti-unitary and changes the factors of i. So I don't know if you most people probably know this, but if you the simplest argument I can come up with is position is even under t, momentum or odds. P is i d by dx, so positions are unchanged. I must be anti-unitary. Though of course in field theory we have more fancy arguments, but it's true. Anyhow, time reversal is is an anti-unitary operation 
that where you, the extra anti part is that you take complex conjugations. And you probably know the time for reversal violation, T violation comes from complex phases in the Lagrangian. But here we see that there's a factor of I in E to the I S. And the, the Lagrangian can be invariant, but the path integral actually isn't. The path integral under time reversal changes direction. And you can get this with quite canonical quantization too. E also with T goes to minus I tau, you get the Hamiltonian running backwards, or you canonical quantizations, uh, factors of I change. The, the conclusion here is that the content of an e to the minus i s theory with an invariant Lagrangian is that the path integral is T covariant, it has the same physics, but a different clock direction. So changing those factors just has to do with that. Um, and so we see this, we saw directly that the positive energy propagates backwards. I'm hold that for a minute. We're going to come back to it when we discuss causality, but that's lesson number one here. If we go to high energy, there is certainly it's not a normal theory anymore. The high mass state has this partial fraction as the the ghost-like degree of freedom. And we're then after what's the impact of that. But first we'll talk about it in, in terms of stability near flat space. Um, the Before I do that, I would like to build in this effect that it decays down to the light states. That model we had coupled it to the, the electrons if it's a heavy mass, the Planck mass, it decays. The, the self-energy enters a particular way. You can calculate it. It's just a normal vacuum polarization. And the imaginary part of it is a positive number. Um, so that we get back to um, this, the heaviness is a positive number. If I now take this propagator, I have the usual piece, the quartic piece, the real part of the self energy, which shifts things a little bit, and the imaginary part. If I get close to the imaginary pole there, it looks basically, remember, the pole is being driven by this Q to the fourth piece. So when I get close to the imaginary pole, it looks like it has a minus sign in the numerator, which we saw from partial fractions. And then this width appears with the minus sign here. So it used to be I epsilon becomes minus I gamma. It also has the wrong sign there. It's the complex conjugate of a usual resonance propagator. And the fact that there are two signs there actually makes a difference, a big difference in what we're about to do. If I go back and look at the propagators now with the width in there, I see, so I've got, the usual propagator, which is the, the massless pole. And I get this high mass pole, which we've seen already. And But both cases here has a decay lifetime. So in both cases, if you look at the evaluation of this using the poles, um, you get a decaying state, not a ex exponential growth. So this is a first indication that these heavy guys can actually be stable. The, you can also argue that they are, when produced, they carry positive energy. And that's because they're produced using the light states. The only way to, the way to produce them is you scatter two of the light states, you go through this resonance and you come back. The resonance propagator near it is the usual bright figner complex conjugated. And the if you if you square that, you get the usual decay amplitudes. So if you look at pro producing this, it carries positive energy. 
but it's a positive energy resonance propagating backwards in time. It's a funny beast. Um, you can get positive energy also using canonical quantization. So I'm I'm not the expert on this. I'm just reading the papers. Um, but roughly, here's the cartoon version. The cartoon version is that you um, get the canonical momentum for this new field. It carries the minus sign. Your canonical commutators then carry minus signs. You solve the ones with the minus signs with an extra minus sign in the commutation rules for A and A dagger. And then the Hamiltonian that looks the usual way actually yields positive energy states when acting on uh, create states created with these operators. This is was referred to by Lee Wick, Lee and Wick, who, who first did it as indefinite metric. It's T.D. Lee and Sean Carlo Wick in the 60s as indefinite metric. Um, so it, it seems that you can get the same answer with canonical quantization. But nevertheless, I'm I'm not going to actually use that as a feature. I'm going to stick with path integrals. Um, so if you look at this propagator with the self energy included, it has if if there were a light resonance. So let's put I put the M back in here. If there were a light resonance, it would come with one sign. The high mass state comes with the other sign. So they're they're the versions of complex conjugates of each other, but they carry the same imaginary part. And this is the this is relevant for unitarity. Um, the imaginary part doesn't depend whether it's a, a which of these options there are. So so that's that's the high mass state. It doesn't, it seems to exponentially decay by itself. Now, the place where quantum field theory is going to break is right now, is causality. It's been known since the original work by Lee and Wick and Coleman that these propagators violate causality on short scales. They, the Time scales involved are the time scales that they live. They propagate backwards in time. They have a different arrow of causality, and this ends up leading to causality violation. So we have to, we seem like we have to accept this. This breaking of quantum field theory. For gravity, it's not necessarily the worst thing because it's somewhere around the Planck scale. Is there a question? All right. Um, and the, let's just go here. The, the, since the Planck scale is inaccessible, we don't know about. This. Gabriel, my collaborator, Gabriel Menendez and myself, uh, gave this the whimsical name Merlin modes after Merlin, the wizard in the King Arthur tales, which, who ages backwards in time. But there is a dis distinction from the usual nom nomenclature ghosts. A Fidea pop of ghosts carries the usual plus i epsilon in the propagator. These, these are different, so they're, they're different beasts. They carry the minus i gamma in the denominator or minus i epsilon in the zero width limit. So they carry a, a change in, um, in, in the denominator in, in the causal propagation direction. And that's what distinguishes them from other ghosts. There's phenomenology been done. Um, I'm not going to review this at all because for gravity, it's at the Planck scale. But it's an interesting question in general. If, if these were applied to other theories, how would you see this causality violation? And yes, you can see it. The Shalane Lehman representation um, is revised. Coleman was the first to write this down that I know of. Um, it, it 
there's actually four poles, even though I say three, there's three massive poles. So I should say massive poles there. There's the massless pole, a pair of complex conjugate massive poles, and a spectral function that also has a pole in it. Um, so you can either describe this like I have been up until now as the massless pole and a one of these massive poles, or I can look at it as massless and three massives. Much of the old literature is actually a little confusing because it misses this last pole, which actually is there. Um, and there's this pa nice paper by Grinstein, O'Connell and Wise, which, which show you how that's important on real calculations. Um, but this, this also helps us understand why unitarity can work. These imaginary poles are like and some of these fake eons that, that their imaginary parts cancel. The spectral piece here actually is, um, is the usual positive definite spectral piece. So here's, here's this takeaway message from all of what I've done so far on this I epsilon. So it's basically I epsilon physics at this stage. The arrow of causality is determined by the epsilons and propagators. They're in turn determined by quantization rules, e to the is versus e to the minus is, which is connected to time reversal. Usual quantum field theory has one direction. It only comes with e to the is. This tells you how positive energy propagates. It gives the conventional clock directions. It gives you an arrow of thermodynamics because reaction directions give you thermodynamics directions. That in turn gives you the arrow of time. So despite some co comments, usual quantum field theory has only one direction. And there's a bit of a, a convention about what we choose it to be. The usual conventional clock duration is the I epsilon properties. The, the quadratic theories violate this. They have, they have propagation in two directions. Stability, I don't really have much more to say. Um, Alberto Salvio gave a bunch more comments on this. Um, and I think it's not actually a settled topic at this stage. My, my point was mainly that for these at least simplified models near flat space, they seem to decay. I don't know if they could be, um, if there could be quantum instabilities through loops at this stage. And one of the mo motivations for doing um, lattice simulations is to see non perturbatively if, if these theories are stable. Okay, unitarity. I think um, unitarity also seems to work here. It's it's a, a bit funny, um, but the, the main point is that when you do cuts in the unitarity relation, so here's the unitarity relation, the cuts only run over the stable particles in the theory. This, the unstable particles decay and you don't make any cuts on them. This looks, funny from our standard approaches. We normally quantize the, the, the free fields and define the Hilbert space from that, and then turn on the interactions and find the instability. And we also use, we tend to do some calculations doing cuts on this, but this is in fact the right answer. If you, if you cut on both the unstable resonances and the particles, the stable particles, you're double counting. Um, and so it's actually a, a interesting role. The, the, if you do this, you can see that the discontinuities are the same for both of these types of part resonances. The unstable normal resonance and the unstable Merlin resonance have the same discontinuities. And you get them by applying the Kikowski rules where you put the particles in the, where the cut is on shell and on the far side of the cut, you use the time reverse propagator. 
Um, not all books have that second rule in it, but it's actually true. The second, the on the far side of a cut, you use the time reverse propagator. Um, so if I, here I've calculated the self energy and it's positive and et cetera. This, this is this is a, a better proof than what I gave before that the imaginary parts of the self energies are positive. With a resonance, you have to sum up all the all the bubble diagrams on each side. <clears throat> um, on one side you have the usual sum, the other side you have the complex conjugated sum. The, the sum is the discontinuity on our resonance propagator is this positive number times d d star, where these the propagators sum, the bubble sum works on both sides of the cuts. Um, it's, it's then just the imaginary part of the propagator. And I showed you earlier, the imaginary parts are the same. Um, so if you go through um, development's proof, you see that the, you, you, you basically get the same physics. I, I'll do it here. Heuristically, unitarity works for stable particles. The cuts through the stable particles are the same as those through the resonances. They, they can be both be in the same propagators. There's no thing there. Development proved the normal resonances satisfied unitarity and these satisfied also. Um, that's not what we did. This is my hand waving way to reinterpret what we did. Gabriel and I have a fizz rev if you want to see the formal proof, but it's full of things that are tough to present here the largest time equation, et cetera. Um, here's an explicit example where you can see it. This is one where this is actually in the spin two channel of quadratic gravity, where the numbers actually come directly from that. Um, the this is the interesting one because it goes right through the the s channel unstable ghost, and um, it's basically the most dangerous channel. the The scattering amplitude then once you resum all the propagators is some prefactor times the, a propagator itself. Um, it satisfies elastic unitarity, sorry, elastic unitarity. Uh, the signs and magnitudes work out just right. If you have these two cha changes in the factors of I, and um, then you, it, it works out in this channel just because you've changed both factors of I in the propagators. Um, the, if you want to see it, this is, this is what the scattering amplitude looks like. It it can be weakly coupled in even in quadratic gravity. It, it grows with energy like gravitational ones and then turns over. Um, I, I'm, I don't want to pretend that things are finished here. Perhaps at higher curvatures, quadratic gravity has stuff that I'm not seeing in Minkowski space, perhaps um, higher order loops have some. There's a funny piece here, which I'm not presenting at all. Uh, Leewick Contour and Selmy's talk presents this in much more detail. Um, Gabriel has tried to get derive these calculations from unitarity and it's been successful. But again, here's where I'd like to do lattice simulations to see non-perturbatively whether the theory is stable or not. Okay, so that's actually conclusion of, of one block of material. And I think I'm actually on track time-wise. The next two blocks of material have to do with re renormalization. So we haven't really talked about renormalization so far. And I wanna do these two, the linear sigma model, and the nonlinear sigma model as examples where renormalization is a little different from the, the usual way and arguing that it needs to be redone in quadratic gravity. And we're in the process of doing it. Okay, so in the first case, it's the simplest model that I can do for this. Um, there's the usual phi to the fourth interaction. 
there's the higher derivatives and the this i'm going to argue that not all renormalization is connected to running this section it shouldn't be that surprising if you if you take the renormalizations um parameter mu in dimensional regularization or you take the cutoff lambda lambda d by d lambda or mu d by d mu does not give you the running but moreover there is running on things that are independent that are um that are finite that are not renormalized and are mu independent and then there's also a lot of simulation for that so i'll show you a bit of that so i don't take credit for it yet um anyhow this is a renormalizable theory you might think it's actually finite because the linear sigma model is renormalizable and this improves the high energy behavior but if you remember there's a it was scalar theories like this there's a quadratic divergence in the mass term comes from this lambda phi to the fourth and the quadratic divergence then in this theory becomes down to renorm to log red mix and it's renormalizable still it's log divergent it comes from the tadpole diagram so the tadpole diagram is sitting sorry down here on the side um the tadpole diagram is just the integration over the propagator propagator is this form let's actually sit on this for a minute let's ignore the k squared piece so if i was to do a cutoff there i'll a cutoff it would go like d4k over k to the fourth that'd be log k log lambda log lambda divergent if i do dimensional regularization d4k over k to the fourth is dimensionless and so it actually gives zero but that zero comes from a cancellation of uv and ir divergences if i now restore the k squared piece i get the uv divergent left by itself it's no longer ir divergent so i get the uv divergent and i get the equivalent of log lambda i get the one over epsilon log mu squared with log mu whereas i would have gotten log lambda before okay so here it's divergent it's renormalized etc but when you renormalize it it just gives you a renormalized mess there's no momentum dependence left over you absorbed all of that you absorb the the divergence log m squared mu squared all into the renormalized parameter and even though the there's a log mu seen here it's not a running parameter it has no dependence on external momentum if you measure it at any scale you get the same value the point here is that there is this external external mass scale and so you can't do mass independent renormalization anymore we're getting these log m squareds over mu squareds whereas in mass independent renormalization mu squared always comes along with q squared or energies so here's one thing that we're, we're seeing that renormalization is different or the running is different there's no running in the renormalized parameter it's also different in that there is running in the unrenormalized parameter here the radiative corrections to the lambda come from the bubble diagrams so the bubble diagram is sitting to the side there they the usual bubble integral has has log q in it has masses in it and if you do that partial fraction remember it was the difference of two propagators well here the two propagators appear twice and so i get two massless ones one massless one massive and two massive ones the epsilons completely cancel out there is no divergence here it's finite it's independent of log mu log mu cancels out between these also but it does depend on q squared so if I renormalize this at low energies, so let's say I renormalize it at some very low energy and change the value of Q, it runs in the usual way. It runs logarithmically as a function of Q up until you get past the high energy threshold, where then when the past the high energy threshold, this, this log goes like log Q squared in all cases, 
when these become unimportant and it stops running. So the behavior is this, it runs at low energies and stops at high energies. So it's asymptotically safe or asymptotically flat, whatever you want to call it. So again, here's, here's a case where the parameter does run, but there's no divergences involved. So again, our usual ways of calculating are not quite right here. Here's the lattice simulation. <laughs> Janssen, Curry, Cutie, and Liu in the early 90s did this. It's not exactly the same theory. They chose a, a, a one that went like the third power of the D'Alembertian, so six derivatives. And I, I don't know what was in their heads, but I expect that it was in order to make the theory finite, so they could have a finite theory. They're interested in studying the heavy Higgs mass case. So having a finite theory removes the, the divergences that we normally worry about in the Higgs mass. They find that the run, running behavior that I described to you, it runs at low energies. Here's lambda as a function of scale, runs at low energies and becomes flat at high energies. Here's the beta function over here. It peaks and goes to zero at high energies. And but the basic thing that I only the only thing I really want to say is that they, when studying this, they found a stable theory. It's Euclidean, but it's a stable theory. Um, they mapped out the phase diagrams. Um, I don't know. They they were interested exploring the physics of a heavy Higgs, and so looking at the the Higgs resonance pole as a function of its mass, as a function of the couplings. Um, and I'm not gonna do any of that. I, I, my, my only issue is that this doesn't seem to have fallen apart, so it seems stable. Here's the other one. This is a, a, in a way a more interesting higher derivative theory. It's the nonlinear sigma model. So this involves a pion field non-linearly realized. The first term is the usual Carl Lagrangian for pions. The, there's a set of terms which are the gasser lloyd field corrections to this that involve start at four pions. So this, these are all four pions. And then there's a term which in Gasser and Lloyd field, when working as an effective field theory, becomes irrelevant by, by the equations of motion. But if you're treating this like a full higher derivative theory needs to be kept. This one gives you fourth order in the, so A has, starts off like the derivative of the pion field. And here's one then with four derivatives on the pion field. So that's the higher derivative piece right there. And the reason this is interesting is because this is very closely, it's physics as far as a theory goes, looks very close to quadratic gravity. It's nonlinear, it has non-perturbative solutions like skirmions, it, uh, it's at low energies, it can be treated like an effective field theory with a non-linear non Lagrangian. Um, Hasenfratz com computes that its basic coupling here is asymptotically free, so it's like the file squared coupling in quadratic gravity. But this one has is is interesting for, for me personally because this is the type of calculations that are already done on lattices. You people doing chiral perturbation theory um, have calculated theories like this, except without the higher derivative piece. You add the higher derivative piece, you can now compare it to um, you can do this on a lattice in a so it's an untrivial theory on the lattice. And it's also interesting because Percacci and Zanusa have uh, explored this in asymptotic safety. So we can do direct comparisons to asymptotic safety by doing this, which are free from the complications of doing gravity. Okay. But what I'd like to, my point in this little segment, which is my last segment, is that I want to argue that this cut, this calculation that House and Friends did here is incorrect. 
that it actually does not run at one loop. Um, and that there will be similar problems with other higher derivative theories, including quadratic gravity. It will take some time to sort out. Okay, anyhow, so there's there's the, the issue. Does the coupling, this basic coupling run or not? This coupling sits in the, the two-point function, um, the propagator. And I've I've chosen a slightly different normalization here because it just works better for this cat problem. Um, the if I go back over here, the two derivative pieces, which is this first piece, has something that's proportional to the mass uh, mass squared. So I just called it an m squared. The four derivative piece came with one over f squared. That here was sitting here one over one over f squared, and the higher derivative piece. So I just keep the one over f squared there and the m squared there. <clears throat> because that shows you where the renormalization happens. And then we don't really have to do the calculation very much, though we we have done it, of course. Um, but the this nonlinear sigma model conserves parity. So the pions being pseudoscalars are only two particles, four particles, six particles, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I'm going to do one loop and get down to a two-point function, I start with a four-point function. And the only four-point function is the tadpole diagram again. The tadpole diagram, I've talked you through it before, but let's do it again because it's the important point here, uses a cutoff. Hassan Fratz used the cutoff. He had integral d4p over p to the fourth got log lambda from there. You can do the same thing dimensionally, just like I did. It's It also has the same form as before. I get a q to the fourth, one over epsilon log mu. Um, now, because the way I've done the normalization, there's no factor of m squared out in front. But, um, and when has and Fretz calculates the running, he takes lambda d by d lambda of this coupling. And that's how he gets asymptotic uh, freedom. We would get the same answer if you took mu d by d mu, where that's the mu there. Um, so that's, that's that would be sort of the usual thing that you might do. It was also what was done in quadratic gravity. These, these same two sort of things could happen there for the quadratic vial squared coupling. But this doesn't, like the other case, which I walked you through before, it doesn't imply um, running any physical reaction because the tadpole diagrams don't carry any factors of the energy. When I do this renormalization, I just get a renormalized constant. There are no kinematic logs there. And this this f doesn't run at all at one loop. And it's traced back to this fact that we were getting log m squared over mu squared instead of q squared over mu squared. We can't do mass independent renormalization in these higher derivative theories because that mass plays an intrinsic role in cutting off the high high moment modes. We do have the possibility of running at two, two loops. There's the diagram is a four particle vertex, two loops. But we, we um, haven't calculated that yet. I think it may be finite, but nevertheless, even if finite, we see that it has the possibility of running. Um, it would then be, if it's finite, it would then be asymptotically safe like the other, calculation that I, we did before. Um, so a couple of comments. This the fact that it's not a running coupling constant, even though it's mu dependent, is really something that we know already. Um, in QED, for example, in the vacuum polarization, if you put a top quark in the QED, in the renormalization constant, you get a log m squared over mu squared. But but the top quark doesn't contribute to any running at low energies. It gives you power loss suppressed. So this 
this argument that I give it that it's not running is is actually very standard. But it's what, oops, again, sorry. What's interesting is that if I just blindly take heat kernel methods and higher derivative theories, it mixes up these tadpole diagrams and bubble diagrams because they both appear in the crucial A2 coefficient. So if you know the, the um, heat kernel methods, the A2 coefficient is the log divergent piece. And it's the one that's used to calculate the running. In usual theories, the, the tadpole doesn't contribute to that. The bubble diagram does. And so you get the usual kinematic running from the bubble diagram. So here's the bu a bubble diagram in a higher derivative theory that contributes to the running because here there is a momentum Q. But however, there's also tadpoles and mixed up in those coefficients are tadpoles and bubbles in ways that have not yet been sorted out. And that's our goal is to sort that out. And this is work with Gabriel. Anyway, so I, this is my last slide of my talk. I guess I'm on time then. I'm, I've taken you through the partially understood quantum field theory that appears in these theories, the quadratic gravity and, and these simpler models. Um, we've talked about the classical limit, unstable resonances, path interval quantization, arrows of causality, causality violations, et cetera. Um, and I've, this most recent segment was on the need for reevaluation of running couplings in that, and the techniques that have been used in the past are not always appropriate. And again, once again, I, I'd like to point to um, the possibility of using non-perturbative studies to on um, Euclidean lattices to study these type of theories um, and potentially compare it to both gravity and asymptotic safety. Anyway, so there's there's my little tour. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Questions, please. Oh, I see, I see two questions. Oh, Philip, Philip, please yes. ask your question. Yes, John, hello. Thank you for the nice talk. Nice, nice to meet up with you again. Um, I had a comment on causality and a comment on your switching the sign of I. The causality yeah. question is, is very direct. If I just have the propagator one over Q squared min uh, plus I epsilon minus one over Q squared plus M squared uh, plus I epsilon, then I have two Feynman propagators independent of the relative minus sign. Both of them are causal. And putting in a minus sign should not, can, I don't see how putting in a minus sign can affect causality yeah. unless you do something later on. Yeah, but that, the, the point is that that's not what emerges from these theories with both two and four derivatives. With two and four derivatives, if you have coupling, well, even without the coupling to the decay channel, even with just the I epsilon, the, the ghost-like one comes with the opposite sign. So there's two choices for that. Um, and, but if you're starting from a two plus four derivative theory, you, you end up with the opposite sign on the ghost. Yeah, but the, the two problems. The two problems. It's not, not, it's not a choice for us. Uh huh. It's a calculation. Well, all right. I, anyway, I, I, I still don't understand the point. The other question is regarding changing the sign of I in the path integral. Yeah. The path integral gives the Feynman propagator, and when you have the m squared phi squared, you yeah. actually have to take, take it to be m squared plus i epsilon phi squared, and then when it's multiplied by the outside i, you get minus epsilon phi squared, which then makes the path integral exist. That's the convergence. So yeah. if you want to flip the outside i, you'd also have to flip the i epsilon right. in, in order to make the path integral exist. Right. And that's I think the reason why you're getting backwards in time propagation. Yes, no, that's exactly what I did, actually. I, I added that convergence factor. 
um, to both the both the uh, e to the i s and e to the minus i s ones, and I got the flip sign. So in yeah. fact, I did. I did the calculation proceeded exactly the way you just described. Okay, so now let me make a comment. So what Carl Bender and I did was when we did the fourth order theory with two oscillators, we found that that i epsilon didn't do the job. In order to make the path integral exist, we had to continue phi into the complex plane. And then we got, then we got a bounded path integral. But once phi is in the complex plane, it's no longer a real field. And that means that quantum mechanically, it's not a Hermitian field. And a lot of the discussion that you've been prevented that is usually presented is assuming that, that these these fields are real. In fact, you can't even show the, the Ostrogrodsky only follows if the fields are real. So once the path integral exists by some mechanism, it doesn't matter which, then you've got a well-defined theory. Anyway, that's that's my comment. Okay. Okay. We have a question from Ruka. When you want to, Ruka, please ask your question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, John. Um, I have uh, two questions. The first is regarding the uh, solid violation. Uh, so my question is, of course, um, because of these two arrows time, uh, you see some violation of solid in the QFT. But once you take your classical limit in the way you define it, would you still see some remnant of classical level of this solid violation? There doesn't seem to be any macroscopic remnant. It seems to be there's on microscopic scales, there are violations. Um, <clears throat> the, the work um, by Tolly and Duram is, is one case where I should, maybe I should have quoted that work. They show that at low energies, the um, violation is within the Compton wavelength of all the particles and on a, therefore unobservably small at low energies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the, so, the way you, you know, again, there's there's the potential for something going wrong that we haven't thought of, but but at low orders, it doesn't seem to. Mm -hmm. So, is it correct to say that the way you um, showed uh, the classical limit of these theories just by taking a low energy expansion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. So, basically, by integrating out the field and uh, you will see it like- I integrate out the field because it's so heavy that it's not that it's not dynamical in the, in the classical limit. Mm -hmm. And then show that it doesn't upset the limit of the theory. You know, in some ways, this is the logic that underlies effective field theory. Also. Yeah, sure, in this, in this side, I was thinking- I'm just doing, is... doing it in this case and showing that it its conclusion differs from taking the Ostrogradsky construction on the classical theory. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not also not the first to do this. I Most of my papers I cite early work by Jonathan Simon, who basically makes the same point. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, just one last question. So regarding this um, uh, discussion of the um, computation of beta functions in quadratic gravity. Yeah. Are you also saying that, for instance, the computation of the um, uh, running of uh, the coefficients of the byte square, yes. which say basically it is only free, yes. should be redone? Also they, need, they need to be redone. Gabriel and I are working on that. So you may, it may also happen that it may happen. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what. My guess is that it still runs because it ran at low energies. I don't see it stopping at high energies because in that case, there is a three point vertex that gives real running. Um, so unless, unless those all cancel at high energies and it becomes flat like my Lambda, mm -hmm. uh, I expect it to continue to run. I mean, one has to do it to see, and one doesn't know what, what the sign of the leftover will be either. Sure, but in principle, it could be also just consistent with what is known already, right? The computation with lattice. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, thanks. 
Okay. May I go to the next question? The next question is from Sravan. Sravan, please ask your question. Uh, hi, John. Uh, uh, nice to see you and uh, thank, you. thank you very much for the very nice talk. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is about, okay, if about, uh, about sixth order gravity, does this uh, considering a ghost as an unstable mode, does it work for if I go to higher derivatives, more than four? Uh, I think so. I haven't, you know, I haven't worked out the signs because there there's been three terms in the propagator. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if, how the signs work out. My, I, I would assume that the classical limit works the same. I don't know if unitarity does. Oh, okay. And when I say X second question is quite related to this, suppose if you have a gravity theory uh, with uh, ghosts, but not, not real poles, but complex conjugate poles. Yeah. Uh, classically, they lead to growing modes, but uh, is it uh, possible to tackle them uh, in this, uh, in, uh, in your uh, way of, uh, QFT, that they are unphysical or they may not, they, they don't give any problems in the classical limit. Is there a way to uh, well, you know, remove in some way, the bad effects of uh, complex conjugate poles? Right. Well, so with the complex conjugate pairs, that's what Anselmi has been doing, but arguing that that they they don't produce any imaginary parts and he would argue that they don't produce instabilities because, because the imaginary parts aren't there. Um, you know, th there is a subtle point which I've completely skipped over here, which goes by the name of the, the Leeuwig contour. Whereas to reproduce the explicit calculations of the discontinuities that which like I presented with you, using these fields, you actually take a, a slightly different contour than the usual contour. And much of Anselmi's work is, is generalizing this Leeuwig contour to higher orders so that it, it can work in general. And the, it becomes a, a, a question that, that I haven't seen my way through completely as to whether that can work at all orders. Um, the Leeuwig contour keeps unitarity working at one loop order. Beyond that, I haven't personally worked through it. Okay, so but, but what is your opinion about this complex uh, kind of I mean, do you think they, they can be bad or they should not be it's better not, uh, we don't have them in a quantum gravity theory because they, well, I'm asking this because they, in the case of non-local theories, they are quite natural to appear everywhere, so. Right, well, you know, so I can't speak to it in, in complete generality. Um, non-local theories, of course, have a different structure than this, and potentially a more complicated pole structure. Um, and if you if they're not local, if you don't put it in right, you lose causality for other different reasons. But anyhow, so I I can't really completely answer it. But I I the answer is that I feel in this context they don't seem to be as dangerous as we think they might be in general. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the next question. The next question is from Gerard. Please, Gerard, ask your question. Yes, uh, I'm a bit concerned about uh, your introduction of an arrow of causality. Yes. Normally speaking, if you have the, all the microscopic degrees of freedom of a system, then there is no arrow. The causality forward is exactly the same as causality backwards. It's just uh, in, in solving equations, we like to go from past to future. 
but the equations themselves are symmetric. Yeah, yeah so I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, the, the, at the microscopic level, we do know what's the, the, the future light cone, what's the past light cone. And we know if we hit two particles together, they move towards the, the future light cone. And that's tied up with this I epsilon business that I've spent time on. Um, and so I, I, I feel that, that this, the macroscopic description that, that we start off with is actually overlooking the fact that quantum mechanics does have a, a sense of directionality in it. Um, and so this, this is not, not your standard interpretation, I, I agree. But I think it's, I nevertheless think it's correct that quantum mechanics has a directionality to it that classical mechanics doesn't. And it comes from the factors of I that appear in quantum physics that don't appear in classical physics. Well, not in ordinary quantum physics. The commutator, well, the, the commutator vanishes or it does not vanish. With space like separated, the commutator vanishes. Time like separation yes. doesn't vanish. Right. But, but the, the arrow, you can you can put an arrow in there saying the arrow goes from past to future, but that doesn't mean anything. If the arrow goes from future to past, it's the same equations. Right, that's true. But that's but it's unidirectional. If you if you put plus i epsilon in, you have to put it in all propagators. If you put minus i epsilon in, it's basically the same theory, exactly the same theory, with the clock direction running backwards. So yes, you can do that. But you can you have to then put it in all propagators again. The you can't maintain causality by having plus i epsilon in some and minus i epsilon in others. And so, for example, you couldn't here use i epsilons and behind the moon use non i epsilons minus i epsilons and maintain causality for the the total space. So the the time reversal symmetry that you see in classical physics. Is changed. I also see in quantum physics. I also see it in the Schrodinger equation. What yeah. I do see in quantum physics is that the number of states then that participates tends to increase. That's called entropy. If you actually right. look at it, and then you see that that thermodynamics comes from the increase of the number of states that gets involved in a certain process. Right. So that, that's not very surprising. If you if you think you are looking at all possible uh, states that participate, then Entropy cannot change anymore, and then uh, and then you have a causality that is forward as meaningful as backwards. You can say I have all states the universe can be in, and all states the universe can go out. Right. And uh, but the uh, the feature of the, the microscopic theory that says that that causality that that these entropy increases in in one time direction is is the I epsilon. So if you take an ordered set of particles and let them evolve. They scatter to the future because of the I epsilons. Oh, I'm not so sure. But there's another thing, which is that in gravity, unlike other theories, the, the politically incorrect particle, the massive spin two object, has a masses which could be millions or billions of times heavier than all the other masses in the theory. Then right. it very rarely enters on shell, it usually stays off shell. As long as they say off shell, there's no real problem. But the problem only arises when the thing comes on shell. And that means you have a much higher time resolution than in all the other theories. So yes. now my proposal will be to first consider quadratic gravity, but say I stay at energies low compared to the mass of that wrong particle. But then if I approach that situation, then what is it that's going to happen? Or can I think of black hole formation or anything else that still has to be dis discussed in gravity? Yes. Uh, I mean, where are the black holes in your theory? They're not yet there. I think you have to put them in as well and then see what happens. Yes, no, I, I, I just, if I understand your comment, I tend to agree with them. And that's what, what my, one of my comments that I made is that the stability of, of the theory at, at higher curvatures, at curvatures of order this mass is not, not understood um, yet because no one's really done the, much of a calculation. There have been some 
something crazy must happen. On, by Bob Holdham and by Kelly Stella, still on singularity resolutions. But you know, I think it's still an open question whether whether the theory is stable or not at high curvatures. Yes. Okay. Oh yes, and uh, this time in inverse or reversal, you can also ask the question of PCT. Is there yes. PCT symmetry in the theory? Yes. Yeah, so the, the CPT would, would take the usual path integral and give, give you back the time reverse path integral with a um with exactly the same physics so it basically would be a symmetry as long as you change the time direction which i, th I think is the standard interpretation mm -hmm. there, there is an interesting thing in which i mean i it was not part of this talk at all but when if you look at time reversal tests many tests that are naively time reversal invariant actually are sensitive to that I and the propagators and are actually not tests of time reversal anymore. You know, you, I'm sure you know this, this is the, the like in triple cross products, you can fa have fake time reversal generated by time, uh, by final state interactions. And, and so many of this, the standard tests of time reversal symmetry, they're actually run forward in time and they, they test the i epsilons also. Yeah, that was not well phrased. I could, I could, I should have to repeat that if I was to convey it more accurately. Time reversal tests are interesting in this context. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a few minutes ago, I saw that Philip would like to ask the question. Philip, are you still want to ask your your second question? Yes, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make a very quick comment. First, to Shravan, um, if you have a theory with an anti-linear symmetry like PT, which is what I look at, then you have states that grow in time and states that decay in time. The only non-zero matrix elements are the ones that connect one that grows in time with one that decays in time, and that's time independent. If you have a matrix element between two things both growing in time, that matrix element is zero. And that's the way that the theory preserves probability conservation. The, the other comment is regarding CPT uh, symmetry. Uh, I showed a paper a few years ago where you would get CPT symmetry if you only had two, two requirements, conservation of probability and invariance under the complex Lorentz group. And that's, that's, that's all that's needed. And then you'll, you'll, every, every, every theory that obeys that would be CPT symmetric without needing the Hamiltonian to be Hermitian, which is why I got interested in it because we have non-Hermitian uh, examples of Hamiltonians. So that, that's the second comment. Okay. I also saw a question from Arkady Tsetian, but now is. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to make a, a comment about this. Uh, yeah. Um, or question. Uh, uh, regarding asymptotic freedom, I think we are indeed somewhat brainwashed by standard theories that there is a direct relation between running of coupling and uh, interaction going to zero at, at, in UV. That's what happens in 5-4 theory or Young-Mills theory. But uh, if you take condensed matter point of view and just randomize this theory in, in normal Wilsonian or Euclidean way, you will get this running of coupling with this artificial mu or lambda or cutoff. Yes, that doesn't mean that that translates into for graviton scattering going to zero in at large momentum. That's, I think, is your point. Yes, that's my point. But I don't see how that changes formal computation of beta function. It will be still the same. The question about for graviton amplitude will be something else. And in fact, it's not clear how to formulate it covariantly. Well, not covariantly, I would say invariantly, 
uh, because indeed in this th in this kind of theories, um, it's not clear what's the physical question about interaction. Maybe, for example, in Einstein theory, you, you talk about graviton scattering, and there we know, say, one loop is just finite; nothing is running anywhere, as according to Toft and Belkin. Anyway, so I think this is very very interesting question, but it's it's more a question of what you actually want to compute and what what is meant by asymptotic freedom. And I, I absolutely agree that the common perception of asymptotic freedom here is probably wrong. I think that's the main point. Yes, thank you. I, I agree with your comments there. Okay. I see also a question from Dimitro. Chilencia. Uh, Chilencia, maybe um, uh, I use the wrong mm -hmm. pronunciation, sorry. Okay, uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for your very nice talk. Um, I, have, I have a question. I, I'm missing something. Uh, when you talk about uh, the, the tadpole uh, in the high derivative uh, sigma model, you said that you still have a log uh, behavior of the loop correction. Well, the loop correction has a, a log of Lambda or log mu, yes. And it doesn't, uh, doesn't have okay. a log kinematic variable. But uh, what puzzles me is that uh, the ghost had a minus, it had an opposite prescription plus I epsilon as opposed to the to five degree of freedom. So a weak rotation would essentially bring an opposite sign to that of the particle. So I suppose that. If you had the difference of two propagators, one of which is having opposite prescription for I epsilon, then you essentially are adding two quadratic divergences to the tadpole diagram. So it okay. should be quadratic actually, divergence. It doesn't change, it turns out, I think it doesn't change the real parts, it changes the imaginary parts. Right. And, and so the, um, the, or something like the tadpole diagram where the answer is real, you get the same real answer. So then it would be just like Euclidean case. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's a little more subtle in the box diagram. I mean, the bubble diagram. But I think if you're talking about the real part, you're still okay. Okay. I see also the second question, maybe the third one, from Sravan Kumar. Please, Ravan, ask your question. Hi, John. Uh, well, well, I have I got another question after uh, uh, your uh, discussion uh, with uh, Herod about the time reversal. Well, uh, in the in gravity, uh, time is uh, quite different and peculiar uh, compared to standard quantum field theory. I mean, my my perception is with respect to in. In the case of gravity, for example, if you take real relativity equation, there is no time expl explicitly appears there, and this creates a lot of problem, uh, which is problem of time in gravity. So I want to know your uh, comment about it because you, are, yeah, I mean your uh, the talk is about quantum gravity, but the time is not there in the one of the most fundamental equation like real relativity equation. So yeah, well, I, I would like to know if you're working on if you're working on some background like like Minkowski or small curvatures, there is still a, a way to define time. Yeah. Um, and, and so in in real physical situations, the, the in a gravitational background, you you still have um, a definition of time, which is the close to the one I'm trying to use. Um, if we're asymptotically flat, I think we're all, we have a, a somewhat of a definition of time. I, there's probably some fuzziness involved, but on on short scales, I mean on long distance time scales on low energies, I think we can still define time. Yes, but in, uh, in the case of curved space time, or in and, and I, I understand the, there's this, the, 
the Euler Dirac equation has a um, has a different interpretation than, than you would get if you're doing uh, field theory on curved backgrounds. But I like field theory on curved backgrounds where I know what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, you know, in many of these cases, you can do operational definitions if you need to with clocks and detectors. Okay, so can can I ask another question? Uh, in in one of in one in one of your paper, uh, papers uh, related to this subject, uh, you wrote that uh, light cones and uh, Penrose diagrams have no meaning in quantum gravity. Can you be elaborate about that? So let me let me let me qualify that a little. Bit. They have an intrinsic. They have an uncertainty, and so they're not necessarily well well defined quantities as you increase the energy. So the, the basic point is that gravitons and photons have different behavior scattering angles. And, um, and that's the calculation at low energies, gravitons and photons and massless scalars and massless fermions um, bend differently in a gravitational field. And that then, makes it hard to define a light cone if the massless particles of, of the theory travel different trajectories. And this, this comes from tidal effects because in quantum effects are not local in position space. Um, and so feel not, not only the local gravitational field, but feel it in, in a region. But then th these effects are very tiny at, at low energies. Uh, but as you start increasing the energy, you start leaving the effect of field theory region and these effects grow to a border unity. And so the, the comment is basically that, that that growth signals an uncontrolled approximation as far as we know, unless your high energy theory has something in it that controls it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is that satisfying? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, More know. questions, please. More questions. If not, let thanks, uh, John, for a very interesting and instructive talk. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. May I ask you, John, to send us slides, please? If I can send you the slides. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And by the way, Irina, may I ask you to send uh, your recording to me somehow? Because yes, I you start but it earlier. takes some time because it makes a um, program do something, some job. It's no, no, I understand. It's fine. It's fine. It can wait. Uh, just once it's done, can you upload it somewhere and I will then re-upload Yes, yes, I will see it well to upload. Uh, yes, yeah. we can discuss with you because the fire is too big. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye Thank bye -bye. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Yep, bye -bye. I stopped recording this. Yes.